Welcome everybody. As we're loading people in, we're going to just start off with uh, the ULI membership video and we'll be right back after that to begin our program. One of the staff members at ULI Toronto came to speak at Ryerson University and I just thought, you know, this is a great way to network and to meet people and to learn more about my city as well because they put on such great programming. To me, ULI has been a crucial part of my career development. Four years ago in Kensington Market, uh, there was a ULI walking tour where I met a senior city planner and uh, we developed a strong working relationship. That's the great thing about ULI is the opportunity to be uh, with like-minded people in, uh, in the industry. I've personally hired people from running into them at ULI and uh, led to a conversation and it grew into an opportunity to join our company. There are just so many opportunities for people of all ages to get involved as volunteers or just to attend the events and get involved. Great about ULI is if there's that someone you've been wanting to meet and you haven't had the opportunity to do so, the roster of members is open. Take a look at who the members are. If that person's on the list, ask one of the ULI staff and they will make the introduction. Conversations that are happening, everything from the technology side of the business and incorporating uh, you know, UTEC into development uh, and urban planning. That's rare to have that kind of um, an entity that can convene conversations from a whole variety of perspectives so that we can and a push and challenge each other to think a little differently about the solutions that might make a lot of sense. Now that I've been a part of ULI for seven years and then I volunteered for ULI, I, I hardly go by without going to an event and not knowing one person. And sometimes I actually find that um, there isn't enough time during the network portion of an event to talk to everybody that I know there. Join ULI to connect with people in the industry, to grow your career, and to give back. Welcome everyone and good afternoon. My name is Richard Joy and I'm the Executive Director of ULI Toronto. I'm pleased to welcome you to today's session, Barry, the Changing Face and Space with His Worship, Mayor Jeff Lehman. Today we will share some valuable insights into the evolving future of Barry, our first ever focus, by the way, we're super excited, um, and how it's been transforming into a destination of choice. We'll be discussing the city's growth from various lenses, including planning, economic, cultural and social. We'd like to acknowledge that the city of Barrie is on the traditional land of the Anishinaabek uh, people and the Anishinaabek including the Odawa, Ojibwe and the Batawatomi nations, collectively known as the Three Fires Confederacy. We are dedicated to honoring indigenous history and culture and committed to moving forward in the spirit of reconciliation and respect to all First Nations, Métis and Inuit people. Before we start, a few housekeeping items. Um, everybody obviously will be on mute throughout the session to ensure uh, and avoid audio interference. Closed captioning is available. There may be a slight delay and it may not be 100% accurate, so please be patient. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A function. In fact, we encourage you to do so and or to upvote questions that you see in the Q&A button by pressing the thumbs up button and we'll try to address as many as we can. This is a recorded session and the recording will be sent to you after the session. If you want to take the conversation online, please tag us with the handle at ULI Toronto or with the hashtag ask great questions. Today's event and all other ULI program would, programming would not be possible without the support of our annual sponsors. I would like to say a major thank you to all of them for their support. Now more than ever, ULI Toronto relies on the support of these sponsors who enable us to put on the quality program we do and to drive our mission to shape the future of the built environment with a transformative impact in communities worldwide. To all of them, we say thank you. We have a very tight hour to explore a very rich amount of content connected to the future of one of our urban's most uh, one of our urban regions most interesting urban frontiers. So I'm going to keep my setup very brief. Today's program is the sixth uh, in a new ULI webinar series exploring the urban transformation of what we are calling the Greater Golden Horseshoes Edge Cities. 
As a chapter or district council of an international organization with deep roots in North America, ULI is proud to showcase the urban leadership of cities like Barrie. The program will consist of three parts over the next hour. Remarks by Mayor Lehman, a panel discussion with staff, senior staff of the city of Barrie, and then finally a Q&A session with you, our audience. So again, reminder to use that Q&A button. I'll now turn the stage over to Andrea Miller, who is the General Manager of Infrastructure Growth Management Division at the City of Barrie. She will introduce the mayor and will be moderating today's panel. It's been a great pleasure, Andrea, to work with you in setting up this event. Andrea has uh, is a registered professional planner who spent almost 30 years in the private sector before joining the City of Barrie in 2017. She leads the Infrastructure and Growth Management Division. And with that, over to you, Andrea. Thanks so much, Richard, and thanks to ULI Toronto for the opportunity to share with your members and the, and the audience um, some great information uh, about this great city, uh, Barrie. It's my pleasure to introduce um, uh, our mayor, Mayor Jeff Lehman, is the 46th mayor of the city of Barrie and has been leading Barrie through an incredible period of rapid change, uh, economic development, uh, and, and most recently, some great um, uh, residential projects. The mayor has um, uh, received many accolades uh, over the last little while, uh, including uh, in 2017, he was awarded the Gil Bennett Award by the Conference Board of Canada for excellence in corporate governance and education through uh, the Director's College. Uh, he was named the 2017 Community Leader Influencer of the Year by the Economic uh, Developers Council of Ontario, and in 2019, um, uh, the prestige U.S. business magazine Fast Company uh, named Mayor Lehman uh, number 26 in his uh, in their list of top 100 uh, most creative people in business uh, for his innovative solutions uh, in government. And with that, Mayor Lehman, um, the floor is yours to address the, the, the group. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much uh, to ULI and to the organizers of uh, these webinars. It's a great opportunity to speak to you. And I, as I uh, snuck a look at the participants on the webinar, I recognize many names. So to those of you I haven't seen in a while, um, one of the, uh, one of the uh, sad realities of COVID times is this is the only way we get to see each other. And I, I look forward to uh, speaking with so many of you uh, going forward after today as we eventually move into economic recovery and recovery from COVID. But uh, at the moment, I want to talk a little bit about what's been happening during COVID, but obviously the bigger picture of, uh, of Barrie. Um, and I think uh, anybody who, who knows the Greater Golden Horseshoe, which is just about everybody on this webinar, I think, uh, knows that we are forecast to grow, uh, but the numbers are, are daunting. Uh, the provincial projections have us growing to 298,000 people by 2051. Uh, and in the space of a generation, uh, 25, 30 years, we would double our population. And I would have told you that until this year, I, I would doubt that forecast. Uh, I used to be in the business. Uh, I have a background in land economics and I used to be in consulting. And I, I would have told you that that was an aggressive number, but COVID has changed many things. And one of the things that has changed uh, is uh, I think people's perceptions about the future of work and how work, uh, the location of work is decoupling for people in certain industries. But one of the things we wanted to talk about today, because we're gonna present to you very from an economic, uh, physical, and as well as social lens, is the inequality that that creates is actually only growing. And <clears throat> the city of Barrie, as we've grown and changed, we, we called this program the, uh, the FACE uh, and space because not only is it about physical planning and the, the buildings we're gonna need to house this growth, but cities are a collection of individuals making choices about their life, making choices about where they live and work and spend their time. And the face of Barry is very much changing. And one of the challenges we have uh, is to tackle the growing inequality uh, that even COVID is, uh, is throwing into sharp relief. I think the last year has shown us that the difference in the social determinants of health between racialized neighborhoods and non-racialized neighborhoods, for example, is an issue in every Canadian city, including my own, uh, but most uh, uh, severely during COVID in, in Toronto and Peel, and we're watching that play out in these days. 
but turning to the bigger picture for, for Barry, I mean, we have had a vision of this community uh, for many years now as being a regional center. It's interesting in the introduction there, Richard was talking about edge cities and Garrow's book, Edge Cities, Joel Garrow's book was uh, an influence on me when I was a little earlier in my career. Now, I've never thought of Barrie as an edge city. I've always thought of it as a regional center, the regional center for Simcoe County, Northern New York Region, Muskoka, Gray Counties, uh, in the same way very much that uh, Kitchener, Waterloo, Guelph are a regional center uh, with its own economy, both as the center of that part of the province in many ways for public services and for commerce, for banks and those sorts of things, but really uh, also in a social role and uh, an entrepreneurial role. And I see Barry's future as playing, as being very much more similar uh, to that role than as uh, and as, a, as an edge city of the GTA. Um, we have a goal to being a city where people can find good and fulfilling careers, uh, not just jobs, not just population serving employment, but an economy that is uh, unto itself and creates opportunities for, for our young people to stay and grow and learn. Um, but, you know, I think it's fair to say as well, and, and events of the past few years have only uh, thrown a sharper uh, light on the need for our community as it grows to be a place for everyone, where everyone feels at home. Uh, and that means tackling issues of social inequality. Uh, that means tackling issues like racism and poverty in our community. And, and I'll say a little bit more about that uh, as, as, uh, as I go. So uh, this is the Urban Land Institute. So let's talk about land. Um, the city of Barrie uh, reached its boundaries about 10 years ago. And for the last 10 years, uh, we have been planning the next stage of growth for our community. And as Andrea referenced, uh, that is going to be quite different, of course, than it has been historically. Uh, let's be honest, in the past, Barry was a bit of a poster child for urban sprawl with uh, almost universally low density uh, residential and commercial forms of development. That's changed dramatically. And it changed in part in the last decade, the first decade of the 21st century, we grew almost exclusively through intensification because very little greenfield land was left at the same time, or the second decade, excuse me, 2010 to 2020. Now we are starting to see uh, the secondary plan areas, Salem's and Hewitt's secondary plans um, uh, be developed. And they are quite different. They're modeled on uh, the, the old east end of Barry Noah's as a mayor, you're supposed to love all your children equally, by which I mean you can't have a favorite neighborhood or a favorite restaurant. When you get asked that, you have to say, oh, all of them. We love them. The truth is there are some things about different neighborhoods that we love. And uh, uh, for me, that uh, in our city is the older East End uh, area of the city. It's built on a grid, finer grained uh, street pattern, more walkable, uh, more amenities within the walking distance, more diversity of housing types. And that's a really key thing I want to talk about right now. You know, I was on Twitter this morning with uh, this ongoing conversation that's going on about um, the supply shortage in Ontario and the effect of the, uh, that on the housing affordability crisis. And, you know, I was saying you can be a progressive and not argue the point that we need a greater supply of housing. We absolutely do. But we need a greater range of supply. It's not just a shortage of single detached homes. It's a shortage of the missing middle. It's a shortage of mid-rise apartments, townhouses, high-rise apartments, supportive and social housing. We need that whole spectrum of, uh, of additional supply if we're going to address the affordability challenge. Now, we're starting to see uh, a huge amount of height coming into our urban growth center, really on a scale that Barry hasn't experienced before. You know, traditionally, the performa for high density development Barry really only worked if you had a water view from the condo, because it was all condos. That's changing. Um, not only is there a workable proforma without a water view along arterial roads or near the GO stations or otherwise, uh, there's also a workable proforma for concrete high rise that is much, much uh, more. Uh, pervasive now because of the rise in, in prices. Uh, and we'll get to the affordability challenges that's created because it's a huge concern for me. But what it has driven is an enormous increase in the uh, number of high rise proposals. Uh, we have at the moment 14 developments in our urban growth center, 
uh, totaling over 3,000 residential units and more than a quarter of a million square meters of commercial gross floor area, so 2.5 million square feet. That is transformative. And you know the politics of that are kind of interesting. You get people pushing back, you get other people who see this as progress. But um, the largest development, uh, the highest tower is 41 stories. And the, the tallest building we've got right now is 16. So that is a dramatic change in built form. And uh, it was not without its controversy, uh, but it happens to be right at the heart of the community at Bradford and Dunlop streets in the west end of our downtown. And, um, you know, when I talk about this publicly, I talk about uh, it in the way that I think people really uh, see density, um, it, they don't see the, the impact of density as positive. Many people see it as uh, contributing to traffic or crime or other problems. Of course, what it does is it creates customers for shops and services. And in our historic downtown, uh, this is key to the vision that we have for the future. We see downtown as a residential neighborhood, as well as the kind of independent commercial district and food and drink district that can really thrive. So, and that's a really key piece because as I said at the beginning, we don't see ourselves as a bedroom community. We see ourselves as a regional economic center. So we want to grow our economic engine here. We want small business to be able to grow. And there's a huge amount of focus right now during COVID of the impacts of the health restrictions on small businesses. Um, we want to create a, a sort of ecosystem in the West end of our downtown that allows everything from food businesses that are starting as a cart or a table at, a, at our farmer's market to move to a food truck or an interim location and then have a storefront. And we've watched businesses follow that path uh, to growth in our community. We actually have a vision for the West End of downtown Barrie as a market precinct, anchored by a new food market uh, that would be similar to the Byward market and um, which, uh, which will anchor a series of small scale public interventions uh, but a much larger residential population. And, and we see that vision uh, coming forward over the next couple of years in conjunction with organizations like the Sandbox, which is uh, a private sector led incubator, which is in our downtown. So uh, we actually have a, new, we, we have a new task force that's going to be looking at the West End of our downtown. And we have a second task force that's looking at building a performing arts center uh, as we do not have a modern performing arts center in the community. But the third one, and I really wanna spend my remaining two or three minutes talking about um, the changing population and the issue of, of affordability here in our community. Uh, we've seen our average house price increase by almost 50% year over year. Barry was in a housing crisis before that. Of all Canadian census metropolitan areas, Barry has, has had historically the lowest percentage of rental uh, tenure and the highest percentage of ownership. And that is a function of how we grew in the 80s, 90s, and the first decade of the 2000s. You know, there are strengths in that. There's a lot of uh, equity that people can access in their homes. Uh, but it has caused such a severe affordability crisis when it comes to rents that our rent is now for a one bedroom apartment, only uh, our average rent, $100 a month less than in the city of Toronto. Now that's partly because the city of Toronto's rental rates have collapsed under COVID and it's a short term situation and it's correcting uh, back again. Uh, but it is in part because Barry has such a substantial shortage of purpose built rentals. So one of our goals right now is to encourage that. And some of those high rise developments we're seeing in our core are absolutely um, a purpose built rental with patient money or pension funds, long-term uh, financing that will support that. And it is very welcome here, I can tell you as mayor. That's the, lar the larger term picture. And, you know, I think this is, this is very much uh, related to the fact that the changing face of Barry includes a much broader and more diverse population. For the first time, now the census data is now getting pretty old because it's, it's 2016. But I, I can tell you these trends have continued that uh, between 2006 and 2016, that 10 year period, we saw uh, 10,000 people move to the city of Barrie, which is actually very low because we had run out of a developable land and we had a, a lower pace of, of um, construction. But of those 10,000 people, 6,000 were visible minorities uh, under StatsCan's definition. And Barry is changing its uh, ethnic composition very quickly. And one of the things that's most interesting about who's coming to Barry 
uh, not direct international immigration, but the second step. So come to the GTA and then move to a city like Barrie. And the groups that are choosing Barrie, a growing Latin community, a growing South Asian community, a growing Filipino community, a growing Black community. It is really great to see that uh, we have people from many different uh, backgrounds who are finding a bit of a community here and certainly finding a community that they want to be part of. So council has as a priority uh, gender and racial equality uh, as we move forward and uh, taking more efforts uh, to ensure that Barry is a, a welcoming location for, for people of all backgrounds as we continue to grow. So I'll just sort of wrap up with a thought that, you know, when I, mayors have elevator pitches, right? And, and, and your, my elevator pitch for Barry for years has been that both Bay Street and the dock aren't very far away. I mean, we're perfectly located halfway between the greater Toronto area and the recreational uh, playground of Ontario uh, in Muskoka and Georgian Bay, and in fact, in here in Simcoe County. But I want us to be a community that has an elevator pitch that is stronger than that, uh, that is not just about location, but is about the people and organizations and networks that exist here. Whether we are uh, growing a business and we have an entrepreneurial network and ecosystem to support that, or whether we are talking about new communities of new Canadians who are arriving and choosing to raise a family here and can find uh, not only people that, that look like them, but organizations that support uh, what uh, uh, their um, uh, integration into our community and celebrate their own diverse backgrounds. And so it's been a conscious effort uh, for us here at the city through our events, through new initiatives this year and in, in, pre in recent years uh, to try and understand that the changing space of Barrie, it can't just be about the changing space, it must be about the changing face. And as we uh, go through those changes, as more people leave the GTA post COVID or during COVID and post COVID, uh, we need to make an extra effort to be welcoming to everybody, not just in terms of helping them find an affordable place to live or a home that meets their needs or a community that meets their needs, but a network of individuals uh, that uh, reflect their needs. So I will leave it there and thank again, uh, the organizers for allowing me to come and say a few things about this fast changing city that I've had the honor to be mayor of for, for the past 10 years. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mayor Lehman, for that, um, that great synopsis of the changing shape and face uh, of this great city. It's my role now as the moderator of the panel discussion to try and uh, allow some additional discussion to happen so that we can build on for the ULI audience a little bit more about our built form, a little bit more about um, our diversifying economic base, um, but also how we're tackling the opportunities and the challenges that come along with um, this rapidly changing demographic. So I'd like to start by uh, asking our panel members uh, to turn their cameras on, which I see has happened. Uh, and um, it, maybe they could introduce themselves. And I'll start with uh, Michelle Newton uh, from Making Change. She's our special guest. Thanks for having me. I am the co-founder of a not-for-profit called Making Change, where we're focused on inclusion and diversity, specifically with a focus on the black lens, um, issues around anti-black racism, building community around Black people and Black culture. And I'm an entrepreneur, so I understand that aspect as well. And thank you for having me. That's great, Michelle. Thank you so much. And I know you have some great resources that you're going to share with the audience uh, as the, uh, the panel discussion continues. Um, Michelle Banfield. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name's Michelle Banfield. And like the mayor, I recognize a lot of your names. So it is great to virtually see all of you. Uh, I am the director of development services at the city of Barrie and am a registered professional planner and super happy to be on this forum. And Stephanie Schlichter. Thank you. Good afternoon, Stephanie Schlichter, Director of Economic and Creative Development uh, here for the City of Barrie. So we encompass all of the traditional economic development uh, repertoire as well as we have the addition of culture development. 
So thanks so much to our panel members and to Mayor Lehman. You're welcome to jump in on, on, on this discussion as we have so much to share in this short period of time. We're gonna jump right in. And uh, knowing that we're at the crossroads uh, in terms of, uh, of some things that are uh, unfolding in Barrie, particularly as it relates to shape and faith, what are the key issues or the lessons that you think we should be acknowledging and why are those important? I'm gonna start with Stephanie and uh, talk a little bit about uh, the economic lens. Certainly, thank you, Andrea. I think it all relates and as Mayor Lehman chatted about it for from the economic development lens, it's talent. And I think talent ties to everything uh, in terms of entrepreneurs feeding the industry that's here. Um, how do we have the skill sets and attract those that are here? And everything is sort of that wraparound from tourism and who you target from that lens. How do we support from that changing face from that diversity and, and, and inclusion perspective? Um, the, the welcoming, how does our built form support those that need to be here and drive those from uh, the different forms of talent that we need from high skilled um, to, to too low skilled. So I think that is sort of a key lens from the economic piece. You're on mute, Andrea. <laughs> and of course, what, what a session would there be in this world of COVID without somebody being on mute? Myself, my, my apologies. Uh, Michelle, uh, would you like to give us some thoughts of, uh, from your lens? I know you don't speak for everybody, but, um, but uh, you, certainly your organization has a perspective. Absolutely, and there is a slide that is, uh, is, if it's available just to show, because I think it frames at least the thinking that I have, um, and I found a lot of responsiveness to this slide when I've been making presentations, and it's the thought between these two different um, puzzles. The diversity puzzle on the left, of course, shows different puzzle pieces. You can think of them as people in the community, different shapes, sizes, colors, whatever their differences are. But the main thread is that they're not connected in any way. And I feel like all of the work that we're doing and, and things that Mary Lehman's mentioned are really working toward the inclusion puzzle. And the thing about it is that's a new puzzle that we each have to build together and each puzzle piece still looks different. There's different color ones, different shapes and sizes ones. When one is missing, that puzzle's not complete. And for everybody to be in a community where it's growing and changing this space and place, each puzzle piece needs to be there for it to be the real future. So I'm, I'm great uh, for you to stop sharing that slide, but it's just a frame that I apply to a lot of the thinking. And you know, it's important because I hear a lot of times, you know, Barry or our community, different communities is getting more diverse. And yet I still feel this sensation that inclusion is not there. We're still on that path and at the beginning of that path in building that inclusion together. Thanks, Michelle. Mayor Lehman, did you have any thoughts on about um, Michelle's uh, last comment about, you know, we are still striving towards that inclusion piece, uh, both in terms of uh, face and shape? Yeah, it's and it's it's a wonderful slide um, because it's very clear. Uh, and I think the you know we as planners we talk about um, the fabric of communities, right? We often talk about it in a very in a very physical sense. We talk about public spaces. We talk about trails and transportation connections and the um, the way that we can use public space to uh, create inclusion. Um, I think it obviously goes well beyond that. And, and I think one of the things that we are, are now um, addressing or confronting in our community a, a, as well we should uh, is, um, you know, so much of this tends to happen uh, individually and um, without uh, the discussion among uh, different communities. And I'm, I'm not thinking here so much of neighborhoods as uh, as diverse communities, whether we're talking about sexual orientation, whether we're talking about um, communities based on ethnic background or, or indeed um, people from different um, sort of social levels in society or, uh, or um, uh, experience in society. And uh, when we talk about inclusion, it's a classic problem. You know, we do consultation and all too often we consult with the same people because the same people self-select. And that, that's not wrong, nor should we ever stop uh, people from 
self-selecting and having a voice, but we need to go a, a bit beyond that. So as we make our plans, there needs to be a very conscious attempt to reach out uh, to different communities, a very quick example. We're gonna have a discussion tonight around a particular location in the city, a, a natural area, and we're gonna hear a lot from the people who live right around it. We're not gonna hear from the people who use it very much because we, we are unable in many ways to, to go out and bring them in as users. And, and this, is a, this is an issue whenever the city sets policy or makes decisions around specific issues. So as we plan and go forward, I think reaching that changing face uh, requires some intentionality. Thanks, Mayor Lehman. And uh, Michelle Banfield, I mean, maybe that we can just build on that a little bit. You are the coordinator of both the policy lens uh, at the city, but also the development approval lens uh, in your role as the director of development services. So building a little bit on what uh, Michelle and, uh, and Mayor Lehman have talked about, you know, what do you think some of the challenges are or the opportunities and how are you and your team dealing with um, these uh, opportunities to engage people, but also some of the barriers that we have been experiencing on development applications, but also some of this policy work. Thank you. And, you know, I think the reality is, is that it's just um, a really big topic and there's lots of different ways that we can tackle it. So I guess I would say, uh, you know, from a policy lens, we continually hear that, um, you know, people just aren't that interested for lack of, um, of the easiest way of saying it, you know, uh, we, uh, until it's in, in their neighborhood or until it's happening right in their neck of the woods, um, you know, it is really tough. So, you know, we have tried um, so many different things and I guess from an inclusivity piece, um, it really is just about trying all sorts of different things, many different ways uh, consistently over time. Uh, so um, from a policy piece, you know, um, you know, we were at some giving out lemonade at, at, at times when the firefighters in the summer spray, uh, spray the kids with the water hose, that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, from a development perspective, uh, it is slightly easier to get people interested, although again, not until the sign goes up or the public meeting happens. Um, but again, even from that perspective, um, it is about, we, you know, we have a neighborhood meeting process that happens outside of a planning application. So even before an application comes in, we ask for people to have neighborhood consultation. Um, but again, you know, hearing from what Michelle is saying, um, you know, even what we're doing, we can always do more. And, um, and I think from Michelle's, even that first slide that Michelle was talking about with the diversity, I would say the diversity are really all the different applications and projects that people come and talk to us about, right? They're like, I've got my piece, I've got my piece. And then the city's role is really making that piece into the puzzle and, and putting it all together and that, that true aspect of, of community development. Michelle, I know you wanted to say something there. And I could add a comment there. And, you know, and, and by all means, I would not say that this comment has anything specific to do with Barry. It is that a lot of the ways that organizations look for input are framed in a white frame because that's the majority population doing the work in the positions and, and, and in those roles. And I mean, we can go back 400, 500 years and, and shouldn't be surprised that that's the frame that we find ourselves in. So it's the idea of figuring out how do you deconstruct that place that we're all sort of automatically starting from and go, that's actually not the right place to start. We don't know what the exact right place is, but we know that's not working. Because I hear in, in some of the messaging from Michelle and, and Stephanie and yourself is of course, that you are welcoming and you're trying to go out there, but when you do the same thing and you don't change it, you should expect the same results, which is no uptake from these diverse communities. You know, when I did a quick poll of people that I know from various different communities, um, I don't know if it's that they're not interested in learning about the future of Barry, but they don't feel the ones that I've spoken to that there's been a thread that they've latched onto. So something's missing. There's that gap between, you know you want the input, but we're not able to attract people of all different differences and backgrounds to be part of it and feel like they're building a place that they belong. Sometimes it feels like you're trying to fit into something that's already there. And, and a lot of us from uh, you know, marginalized communities, we don't wanna fit into something that's already there. We wanna build something new together. 
And I think that that's a great point, and it's certainly um, part of some of the conversation that um, that we've had in preparation for this session is, is that, you know, we need to have this conversation. We need to recognize that we may be welcoming, and we, we think we're welcoming, and we think we want the input, but what do we need to tear down in order to get to that future that, um, that the mayor has described and that we as, as staff are all working towards? So I really do appreciate you um, being willing to have that conversation and, and help us as we move forward. I'm going to talk um, sw switch directions a little bit. I know that there are some comments that are coming up in the chat that I'm watching. Uh, and um, let's talk a little bit about affordable housing. And uh, Mayor Lehman, I know that it is one of your um, passions. I know that it is, it is a council strategic priority. And if we talk about um, affordable housing and um, what the um, evolution of our city in terms of accommodating growth, accommodating uh, diversity, where do you see um, the opportunities and challenges? Oh man, well, I'm, I promised to only talk for a minute or two here. Uh, Housing is a spectrum. It is everything from um, tackling chronic homelessness through to trying to shift the entire uh, market so that we create uh, more supply. And, I, you know, the, the argument I was having on Twitter this morning was you can be progressive and not be against adding supply because we need such a range of supply. Um, and there has been a shortage. Uh, we, you know, there's been a lot of discussion in ULI and other organizations around the missing middle. We are seeing the construction of a lot of the missing middle density, medium density housing in the city of Barrie. We're seeing that near the GO stations and on arterial roads with townhouses, with uh, mid-rise apartments. And, um, you know, these are communities uh, which serve uh, a population that has traditionally not been catered to by the development industry in our community. We have traditionally been a home building uh, uh, community building houses, building single detached houses. And now with new entrants, both people coming from other parts of uh, the Greater Golden Horseshoe to build in Barrie, uh, as well some incredible developers locally who have pivoted to bringing new types of products to the market and are in the business of creating new communities that can serve a uh, population with, at different income levels uh, and often with different lifestyles. And that's something that really is, is changing. I think there's, there's all kinds of assumptions about the way people live in home design. And um, I, I think the, the fact that we are now seeing such a, much, uh, such a broader range of units speaks to the fact that just the market side can respond to some of the changes in, in our community. However, I will say this, that at the hardest to house end of the spectrum in terms of homelessness and individuals who uh, are, have experienced at least some homelessness. There is no answer without government investment, and we are trying very hard to see the federal and provincial governments invest here the way they have invested over the last year in cities like Toronto and Hamilton and, and London and Vancouver. Because the affordability challenge is every bit as serious here, we need the investment here. We haven't seen it yet. Uh, that investment looks like supportive housing, which is the best response to chronic homelessness. So very complicated issue. We have a new task force. We have a new strategy 2.0 uh, to come, uh, which Michelle and yourself have been doing great work on. Um, but uh, the short answer is we need a much broader range of supply and we need more of it. And we can't shy away from the fact that we need more inexpensive housing of a wide range of types uh, within the urban area. Thanks, Mayor Lehman. Michelle Banfield, I know that Tom, um, we've been doing, uh, trying to do some great work with our industry partners, um, uh, many of the um, the people that are in the audience uh, today. And, and maybe we wanna share a little bit about some of the ideas that we are trying to pursue and some of the successes that we've had because it's important not just to the processing of development applications, but it's in, important to our, um, the, our vibrancy and it's also important to our sustainability from an economic lens as Stephanie's trying to attract businesses uh, to our community. Uh, those businesses need to have employees who um, have somewhere to live. So what are we doing in terms of our partnerships uh, with the industry? Well, you know, certainly um, the affordable housing strategy is showing some great strides on things like second suites and third suites and, you know, using some of our developers in the secondary plan areas 
um, you know, requiring that they um, allow us to um, put second suites in right at the get-go. So there's not that, that retrofitting afterwards. So, you know, that's kind of one example. And, and as I said, we have made some, some great um, strides in that perspective, but um, the reality is there's more work to do. So certainly, um, you know, when we do get the development applications that come in, you know, we, we do uh, work with um, the applicants when they have the um, either purpose-built rental or uh, wanting to do some partnerships themselves uh, with some of our great social service providers in the municipality. Um, that's something we encourage those relationships. We encourage um, uh, a development of that through our new CIP. We just did a brand new CIP in, in 2020 at the start of 2020 that really um, you know, dedicated over $1.7 million to uh, private projects. Um, that have uh, either purpose-built rental or affordable components to it. Um, and even kind of like the kind of even the lower end of affordable, if you will, because the reality is the affordable definitions in the city of Barrie um, are challenging. And, you know, back where, you know, we first moved from, you know, more like single detached homes to the townhouses and to those mid-rise uh, developments that the mayor was talking about, for, for a time, that was enough to kind of broaden the spectrum and, and broaden the range of affordability. And um, that's kind of the low hanging fruit. Now, what we're seeing is one, after the first purchase, it's, it's tough to, to maintain that affordability. Uh, and then the market really has just kind of outpaced um, that, that level of affordability. So you start getting those census data, data, census data in and nothing is affordable in the city of Barrie. So again, the partnerships are super important. The, the, the use of the CIP, um, you know, broadening our interpretation of uh, what's affordable and what um, how to how to get some of those supportive housing units. Uh, really, we're open to kind of uh, any any idea, but definitely we can't do it alone. Thanks, Michelle. Can I add a thought in there, Andrea? Sure. Just a, briefly, I know time is always short, so you know the idea of thinking about planning as an island you know, is where you're gonna hit shortcomings. And I say this because as you build alternates for, you know, second suites or third suites, and the community at large is still unaware of their own biases, whether they're racialized biases or discrimination or all of these foundations that are still very, very, very embedded in our society, they might not be able to let people rent those homes, those units. They may be limiting who can who can rent them. So it's also the idea I think of: is there a way that planning can work on this, you know, social education project? Is there a way that that can be something that you you embed? You know, whether that's taking people who are building second and third suites and herding them into a room and saying, okay, we're going to talk about anti-black racism today. I don't know if that's the answer. But I think that those are also parts of potentially a solution going forward where the community looks more inclusive. Thanks for that, uh, Michelle. And I, I do think that that's uh, you know, part of the reason why we wanna be having this conversation even today is, is that um, you know, we need to look at things differently and we need to find some solutions um, that, are, uh, that are inclusive uh, and breaking down some of those, um, uh, those barriers that um, uh, maybe unconsciously are there. So um, I'm gonna switch a little bit to um, back to economic development. And uh, Stephanie, I know there's a couple of uh, comments that are coming up in the chat talking about the downtown and talking about um, opportunities there that there seems to be a lot of bars uh, with great food and great uh, opportunities, but what's the shopping like? What is the, um, the diversity like in terms of opportunities um, for um, cultural events? What is the opportunities for, um, we have our entrepreneurs entrepreneurship uh, hub at the Sandbox Center. So any thoughts there in terms on, on how our downtown is an important um, um, a spoke in this, uh, this hub that we are trying to create? Uh, there's lots I could talk about, so I will try and be succinct and focus on the key areas. I mean, the city has invested significantly in the downtown uh, in terms of opening up the streetscape, 
Um, yes, we had to do some infrastructure underneath, which is great, which prepares us for growth from that side of the fence. Um, but also we used it as an opportunity to expand at our street and change our streetscape to allow more pedestrian flow. We work very closely with our uh, business improvement association. We've been piloting um, to support downtown through COVID actually closing down a portion of our main street uh, on Saturdays, which has been tremendously successful and looking forward to doing that again. Um, Barrie is definitely a foodie town. So yes, the, you can find all, court, all sorts of cuisine, um, but the shopping is still quite eclectic. Um, and I think Mayor Lehman referenced that we've got 14 development applications in and around that yes, increase residents, you need residents to drive employment, um, but that also drives the shopping piece. And so um, I think that there will be continue to be a wealth of opportunity for businesses downtown. Um, and we certainly, through COVID, we've seen some transition, but we have had a handful of stores open and still choose to be downtown, um, even with uh, uh, COVID and some of the challenges uh, in the short term, they see the long term opportunity. Um, I think some of the other pieces looking forward is looking at that second floor. So going beyond the main street and how do you look at that second floor uh, as a place to, again, knowledge based some of that technology um, and some of those digital sectors. And we've seen quite a few uh, digital agencies choose downtown as their core because of the vibrancy um, that's there. And with that, the city has also invent, uh, invested in a significant um, Meridian Place, which again, you tie in the culture, you tie in the arts piece, um, and that really is a venue that provides staging, provides public gathering, again, to really just drive that vibrancy into the downtown. So I want to jump on support what <laughs> Stephanie just said. Public space is one of your best economic development tools. And the, you know, patios in downtown Barrie were something that uh, were controversial, if you can believe it, uh, 10 years ago when we started to allow our bars and restaurants to have them. Now we have almost 40 of them and they are wonderful public space. And the fact that you've got live music, food, drink uh, and events all in an area, we started to hear, I started to hear the principles of tech companies, whether they were two or three person tech companies, or in some cases we had uh, companies with 30 and 40 employees who, you know, historically in a city like Barrie would just pick a cheap, you know, industrial unit or a strip plaza or somebody's house or something. Uh, they started to choose the downtown to be close to that. So when we make these infrastructure investments, when we invest in public space, we are uh, creating an economic development uh, benefit. Michelle Newton, yes. Can I add one quick comment there? So uh, with one of my other many hats, I am a mentor with the Henry Burnick Entrepreneurship Center. And uh, one of the observations that I'm working on for a research project there is that a lot of ethnic or diverse uh, business owners don't engage with the current infrastructure that's there in terms of, uh, they call it the business ecosystem. So when you look at the clients of Small Business Berry, or you look at who's going to the sandbox, you will not find it as diverse as actually the businesses are. And so looking at how do you engage these diverse business owners in the projects that revitalize the downtown, in putting applications there. And that goes back to that same concept that the methods that we're traditionally using don't have a broad enough approach or the appeal is different to people that we're trying to attract. And, and so they don't notice that we're doing this work. So I just put that out there that it pervades all of these pieces that are part of this changing place to get the changing faces to be engaged in changing the place. We really need to deconstruct and look at something different to engage them. And maybe I'll just wrap up the panel discussion um, with this question. Is this unique to Barry? You know, are we the only people who have been ex, um, uh, experiencing some of the challenges, um, whether it be around uh, inclusiv inclusivity for um, economic uh, entrepreneurship or affordable housing or public spaces? Or are we uh, able to learn from others around the province or others around uh, the world? Mayor Lee? Quick answer, of course, we're not the only ones. And, and yes, there's a, there are lessons from around the world, but I think a couple of pieces are uniquely uh, severe in Barrie. 
Um, one is the pace of growth. We, we went from being a very small town in the 80s. Uh, we grew incredibly quickly. And we did not grow in a very diverse way, either in terms of built form or in terms of, of our population. And that is now changing and we need to be intentional about responding to it. The second thing is because we have such a shortage of supply of rental housing, we have an extreme affordable housing crisis. For a city our size, our rents are way out of whack. And I would invite the ULI members on this call to be part of the solution for us, which is a range of new supply of multiples. And we will welcome that development on our arterial roads and especially in our urban growth center. A lot of it is already coming. So come take a look at what's going on and help us be part of uh, creating a broader range of housing choices for people. Thanks for that, Mayor Lehman. I know that there is a comment uh, in the chat that talks about if we have some ideas or some proposals, how can we share them with you? Uh, and I'd say, well, bring it on. Um, our door is open. Either contact myself, contact Michelle Banfield, contact Stephanie, um, and uh, we're happy to, to talk about it. Uh, and then we can obviously uh, share things uh, in terms of process with everybody. Um, Richard, I know that we are a little bit over time on our, our panel discussion, so thank you for your patience, uh, and maybe I'll flip it over to you. I know that there's a number of other questions that we're more than happy to continue um, to answer those that are in the chat or, or elsewhere. Well, thank you, and in actual fact, we're, we're in good, reasonably good time because you've been doing an excellent job of dipping into the audience Q&A, so thank you for doing that, Andrea. We've, we've actually managed to hit a few, but uh, so I'm going to be pretty selective, but let me just, I'll just, I'll just respond uh, to Mayor Lehman's uh, 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 challenge, and we'd be very happy. Uh, in fact, it's something that the Urban Land Institute does uh, quite regularly, is bring together um, professionals from multidisciplinary backgrounds uh, to help uh, cities think through land, any number of challenges, including um, that that you men mentioned about uh, diversifying supply. So we'd be happy to, to cycle back with you all on that at, at some future date. Um, we're often invited to do these sorts of things, in fact. Um, some some great questions. Let me ask, this as an outsider though, the, the sandbox is men mentioned a couple of times and I know that's not a question on the chat. But quickly, can someone tell me what, what is that, the sandbox? Go ahead, Steph. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, the Sandbox is uh, one of the first um, private-led uh, entrepreneurship centers cultivated in our community. It was the idea was spawned um, through a collective of business owners in the city who really wanted to um, see that collision between their existing businesses and how do you drive innovation and that's connecting through new entrepreneurs and creating that space where you can really push forward that agenda. So the city is a partner. Um, we have um, located the sandbox in our downtown core, uh, right on the second floor of our transit terminal. So from an accessibility and driving again, that revitalization and entrepreneurship lens, it's, uh, it, it's really right there in the heart of the city. I don't know if you have anything else to add, Mayor Lehman, to that. Well, just that it, it, its name is intentional. It's a collision center. And they talk about it being a collision center because it is where um, uh, people from different sectors and different uh, business uh, places in the development of the, their business can can collide and um, uh, experience the benefit of, uh, of interacting with one another. So there's a mentoring piece. There's a networking piece. Most of all, you would not know you're on the second floor of a transit terminal. The physical space itself is spectacular, um, partly for legacy reasons. The building's on our waterfront. So this is worth coming and taking a look at if you're a, if you are a small business interested in, uh, in a community that will help you grow. Amazing. Um, since you mentioned transit, I'm gonna to jump to the question that, that, that asked the question that probably a lot of people are wondering from uh, south part of the Greater Golden Horseshoe. Um, and that is around the uh, Barry train. I know in Toronto, um, you can see the infrastructure of the Barry line as everybody knows it as, because that's what it is, um, being ramped up. Um, and I know that, that, that these things do take a while, but what give us a, maybe a flavor of what the, uh, when you're expecting to see increased transit connectivity to other parts of the GGH or increased uh, frequency, I should say, because it already exists, obviously. Maybe I can start and give it to Andrea. 
Um, yeah, one of the frustrating things, many things of, that got interrupted by COVID was the expansion of Go Rail service. I mean, we've seen pretty substantial ridership growth. Uh, the Barry line used to be one of the lower ridership lines. Now it, it, it is often one of the highest, uh, but uh, primarily in the south part of the corridor. Uh, we, we have good ridership out of Barry. Uh, it will increase, I think, uh, as the air, as our population increases. Um, but electrification is really the key in terms of increased frequency and in service. Uh, yes, there's some hard infrastructure like the diamonds in Toronto and the structures that need to be expanded to allow for double tracking where there where it doesn't exist on the line. Uh, but really, the 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 service quality will be driven by the speed and frequency of Go trains, which is then driven by the technology, which is the electrification. So uh, I think it will be a big piece. I, I think, though, if I might, the changing nature of work is going to mean that people, uh, I actually think the Go train is going to have a huge future. And here's why. Because people aren't going to go every day. For There are some that are going to go. And let's be frank, the Go train serves PDO1, the Downtown Toronto Planning District. It's a radial system. And notwithstanding, once we get Crosstown LRT and other things, you'll be able to access other, other employment centers. But it was only just recently at Downsview that you could go anywhere other than downtown Toronto uh, and connect on the Go Rail system. So I think that's still going to be its primary focus. And with people being able to work from home uh, and learning how to work part by Zoom and part in person, which I think is the future of a lot of white collar employment. Uh, I think you're going to see people choosing to live in cities like Barrie and Guelph and Waterloo and ultimately St. Catharines and so on, where you can, if you're going to downtown Toronto, you're only going once or twice a week, but you're going by train. That's pretty great uh, because you get to live in our community uh, and you get to travel by train and it's all useful time. So long answer, but I think it, the go rail system ultimately is really going to bounce back. It's a great answer, in fact, and uh, it's a topic that we're going to be returning to uh, as well. So stay tuned. Uh, one quick question with just a few minutes left. Uh, I don't think you've touched on a lot of livability. I'm going to maybe pitch this one again to uh, Mayor Lehman. Um, factors as being huge, huge magnets for the right kind of growth. Uh, and I absolutely agree. And I, I'll just say uh, by way of editorial comment, you can really uh, you've been a mayor for 10 years. You can really feel that leadership uh, of you and your team uh, that 10 years that I've been in and out of Barry has seen a lot of change. And, uh, but here's one question. And I'm not sure that, uh, if this is a good one or, or not, but it, bicycle infrastructure uh, being raised by Jordan, uh, critically important uh, to affordable lifestyle, uh, reducing traffic, et cetera. I'm going to read the whole question. Um, what is the state of cycling infrastructure in your city? Oh, so that's a, it is actually a really great and topical question. It, it has, it's related to the diversity of the population. It is related to different socioeconomic status. I mean, there are people coming to Barrie who come from places in other parts of the province or in other parts of the world where cycling is much more common and they are to, trying to here and struggling to. Um, our cycling infrastructure has historically been terrible. Uh, it is recently, I would say, better. Uh, we have plans to make it great. And it's funny because on Saturday at a town hall in uh, Allendale, which is Ward 8 to uh, one of the older areas of, of the city, and we are converting a classic over wide arterial road. It's, it, it's a one lane arterial road, but it's wide enough for almost two full lanes. It's just the way roads were designed in the 60s. Uh, and we're going to take all that extra space and make a standard lane and then a separated bike lane. Uh, and that is going to connect our waterfront and the GO station on the waterfront to actually one of our employment areas. And it's a really actually a key piece because a surprising number of employees, especially, you know, and I see it right now, and people who are getting to work, they don't want to go on transit because of COVID. So they're cycling. And guess what? Uh, the infrastructure for them to get to our employment areas, to some of those essential jobs, is terrible. So it's a new reason in the last year, like we needed one. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful, um, um, uh, you know, you can't buy a bike anywhere right now because so many people are out trying to cycle during COVID. And I hope it's one of the things we keep from COVID going forward, that more people can cycle to work. So there's big plans. We're trying to add a couple of hundred kilometers of dedicated cycling infrastructure. It, we are challenged by the fact that we didn't do it right in the first place. So, um, 
you know, just like in that Avenue in downtown Toronto, which is absolutely jammed with cyclists, the right of way is narrow and you're going to have points of, of pain where we have to be really careful that people are kept safe. Um, but there are plans to do a lot more. And we're, by the way, every time we redo a road right now, we add a bike path. Every, every single arterial road that gets redone, we do it. And we're doing road diets, which is where we take a four lane road and make it a three lane road with bike paths on either uh, side. So the three lane road has the turn lane in the middle, one general purpose lane in each direction, and it actually acts as traffic calming. So where we can do that with uh, underutilized roads, we're, we're doing Amazing. it. Amazing. Barry, you are super impressive. Super impressive. It's been such a pleasure for us to uh, put the spotlight on your city. Uh, biggest question of the whole session for me is why haven't we done this before? But you can be assured that we'll be wanting to come back and pulling on some of these threads. We obviously didn't get to all the questions. Um, and I and that's usually the case when we have a good program. And so take that as a, as a great compliment. Um, but to those whose questions didn't get answered, we are recording them. And we'll make sure that they get a uh, uh, cycle back up to the right people. We'll try to find some ways to address them, if not uh, directly in future programming. Uh, so on behalf of the ULI Toronto, our membership committee, uh, I want to thank uh, Mayor Lehman, Andrea, Michelle, Michelle, um, Stephanie, uh, for speaking with us on various growth and intensification and your, and your growth story. Thank you for focusing on diversity and inclusion. Um, that was all you, and we really, really love to see that. Um, so final closing remarks, just to, to uh, remind people tuning into uh, today's uh, session that we will have this on record. Um, there's a lot of future programming. We've got uh, three more this week alone, uh, and uh, they're all up on the screen there for you to look at. So please uh, do tune in. Um, we love uh, our audience, and uh, so we, we hope that uh, we're keeping you coming back with these, uh, with these great programs. But with that, I will sign off and say thank you again to everybody from the very end, and we'll talk soon. Bye-bye.